Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're uh, calling in from. I'm Donna Drynan, and I'm a CIHC board member, and it's my pleasure to moderate this IP Global Cafe today. I would just like to acknowledge before starting that I am coming to you from the traditional territory of the Kumeyaay people, which is uh, um, down the San Diego in San Diego County. And it's such a privilege and um, very grateful to be able to get to work from this part of uh, uh, this beautiful country. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce John Gilbert, who is a dear long time, I'm not gonna say old, long time colleague of mine from the University of British Columbia. Uh, Dr. John Gilbert is a global leader in interprofessional education for collaborative people-centered practice and care. He is Professor Emeritus, University of British Columbia, a senior scholar who collaborating center on health workforce planning and research, Dalhousie University adjunct professor, University of Technology, Sydney, and is founding chair of the Canadian Interprofessional Health Collaborative. He was co-chair of the WHO study group on interprofessional education and collaborative practice. He was elected a fellow Canadian Academy of Health Sciences in 2008, appointed to the Order of Canada and awarded the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal in 2011. He received the degree Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa from Dalhousie University in 2016, and was the recipient of the Pioneer Award National Center for the Interprofessional Practice in Education, USA in 2017. The World Health Organization's Framework for Action on Interprofessional Education and Collaborative Practice, released in 2010, explained how a collaborative ready workforce is a key step in moving health systems from a fragmentation to a position of strength. In this cafe, Dr. Gilbert will revisit and summarize the key features of the WHO's framework and outline action items that remain applicable to the local health systems. He will highlight the need to adapt policies to fit local challenges and needs. So my pleasure to welcome John to start the session. Thank you, Donna. I'm going to share my screen. And here we go. Well, there we are. Can everybody see the screen? I hope. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I too am from the ancestral, unceded, occupied lands of the Musqueam peoples here in British Columbia. I'd also like to acknowledge the many, many, many people who contributed to the development of the framework between the years of 2008, 2010. Um, too many to number, but it isn't one person's job to do this kind of work. And um, over the two years that we worked together, it was an incredible privilege to have the company of colleagues around the globe. And today I thought that we might uh, start with an upside down world to recognize that um, we are not all Western oriented. Um, I really like this map. So the framework focuses on the importance of introducing interprofessional education and collaborative practice as strategies, strategies that can transform the health system. And we all know that it's no longer enough to, for health workers to be professional in the current climate. <clears throat> they really do have to be interprofessional. And um, what I would like to do is kind of reprise a little pre-framework history with you. Um, I'll revisit and summarize the key features of the WHO framework. And I'll also talk at the same time about actions that have been taken since 2010 that are applicable to local and global education and health systems within the context of the framework. And then, talk a little about policies to local challenges and needs. So that's my kind of talking points for today. And, um, you know, history did not begin yesterday. And when we began to organize uh, this discussion around a framework, we looked back at that history and said, hmm, you know, in 1964, John McCreary at the University of British Columbia wrote this classic paper 
um, and said they've been isolated in various parts of campuses, universities, using different teacher, teachers, teaching different vocabularies, building up artificial barriers between the disciplines. And he said, all of these diverse members of the health team should be brought together during their undergraduate training years, taught by the same teachers in the same classroom on the same patients. Sound familiar? We're still at that place. And then in 1972, the National Academy of Sciences also ran a wonderful review of education for the healthcare team and said interdisciplinary instruction will require the faculties develop new skills, new roles, and work to understand the impediments that have accumulated to hamper cooperation among health professions. Sound familiar? And then learning together to work together, a WHO uh, report published um, in 1988, the almost universal practice of educating health professionals in different settings and different types of educational institutions is the most common obstacle to multi-professional education. Sound familiar? And then <laughs> we got to the place where we said, why is it that after all these amazing reports, we still seem not to have made very much progress? And so we looked at the difficulties that seem to be universal. Um, by that, I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about a program or a, sorry, a, a government in North America or a government in, in Asia or a government in Africa. There's always this problem between the health system and the educational system in talking about how to develop a health workforce. So planning and policy making didn't seem to fit when you looked at health systems on the one hand, education systems on the other. And quite honestly, we still have this problem. Um, I'm sure that there are many of you online who recognize that sometimes our health systems don't talk to our education systems, or sometimes quite often they don't. So we said, well, supposing we were looking at a future health workforce. We know what the present workforce looks like. What would that require? Well, it would require pulling together the ideas that I presented originally from the history around this notion of interprofessional education, learning together so that after that interprofessional education, we would indeed have a collaborative practice ready health workforce. Much easier said than done, as we all recognize, but that's where we were kind of not kind of, that's where we were coming from, reading a lot of material about the history of how um, the attempt and desire to move into professionally had somehow or another fallen off the rails. So we went then back to that previous slide and said, well, if you look at the educator mechanisms and the curricular mechanisms, what seem to be the big issues that get in the way of developing interprofessional education at university, college, institute sites. Um, we have to be careful because um, I am going to move to talking about the health sector in just a moment, which we worked on for quite a long time. So we looked at the kinds of issues that you are confronted with, I'm sure today, oh, sorry. If you look at educator mechanisms, think about the problem of staff training, what we call faculty development, right? How do we put together faculty development programs that are really geared to interprofessional education, learning, and practice? If you look at the educator mechanism, you say, well, who should be the champions to carry this forward? And if we have champions, what kind of institutional support is going to be necessary and sustained? Huge issue sustaining. And then how do we bring managerial commitment to address interprofessional education? Who is it in the managerial levels who have to be convinced that actually this is the way that we should now be moving uh, health and social care um, professional education? And then what are the learning outcomes? You know, what are the things that we would be looking for that would say these graduates, these people about to enter professional practice are different. The learning outcomes of what it is that we've done around interprofessional education 
have led to differences in the way in which they practice. So, that, so those probably sound pretty familiar and they were, we heard it all the time as we were trying to come to grips with putting this uh, framework together, we heard these things all the time. And then when you look at the curricular mechanisms, I'm sure these are familiar and they are still issues. So logistics and scheduling. You know, one of the big complaints is, oh, we don't have enough time in our schedule to put this thing called into professional education. And we heard that time and time and time again. Oh, and we don't have the places to do it. Logistics, the program content. Now, who was going to define what the curriculum should look like? What should be in it? How it should be laid out, et cetera. Should, should the attendance for interprofessional education be compulsory? This was, this was an actual discussion, you know, should everybody have to attend? And you think about now, as we will see, everybody attends if we're going to do it. Um, shared objectives. How do we get different faculties, different professional programs, different organizations to share the objectives so that everybody is pointing in the same direction? And then really important, um, these uh, adult learning principles as opposed to pedagogy you know, andragogy, what are the adult learning principles that we need to bring to interprofessional education to make it effective? And then learning methods, we've looked at lots and lots of learning methods, and I know that that's, that, of course, is still going on now. Um, contextual learning, we talked a lot about, oh, how about problem-based learning? How about case-based learning? How about all those forms of learning? You know, what is the contextual learning? And then assessment, how do we assess the in, at interprofessional education in ways that are different from the normal assessment for professional education. So these were huge issues and they're still with us. Um, however much we like to think how far forward we moved, when you go to programs that are beginning, you see these issues come up time after time after time. So in the framework, we try to come to grips with them. Well, it was just about that time that we published the report um, that The Lancet came out with this amazing report called Transforming Education to Strengthen Health Systems in an Inter Interdependent World. Page 1923, laudable efforts to address these deficiencies have mostly floundered partly because of the so-called tribalism of professions. The tendency of the various professions to act in isolation, or even in competition with each other. Sound familiar? So we said, okay, here we have, and it, this was a, and is a remarkable report. If you have not read it, you must read it. It, it really set the direct, the kind of post-Flexner direction for health uh, and social care professional education. But look, tribalism, I mean, way back, you know, 64, we're seeing this kind of issue being raised as one that needs to be attended to. Ah, but then over the next three years, we had an opportunity to actually interact with the WHO and have good input into the report that came out, Transforming and Scaling of Health Professional Education and Training. On page 44, we managed to get into recommendation nine, health professionals, education and training institutions should consider implementing interprofessional education in both undergraduate and postgraduate programs. This was a huge step forward, huge, but it's okay to give direction, but then of course you have to expedite it. But this was, this actually put us kind of on the map as, as a kind of downstream effect of that framework report. And some wonderful things then began to emerge. So the University of Montreal in Quebec um, came, uh, developed a wonderful collaborative patient practice um, and social care uh, program that was truly interprofessional is still in place. And in Bangkok, in Thailand, um, the professor of ophthalmology developed with her colleagues a wonderful syllabus around interprofessional education. You can find this online. Um, so, in these different parts of the world, we were beginning to see, you know, the emergence of, <coughs> of, of kind of mechanisms of techniques of, of devices that were addressing some of the issues that had been addressed in the framework. <clears throat> so we said, okay, so we're getting the learn together, together, 
Now, what about working together? So what are we gonna do about a collaborative practice ready health workforce so that we do get optimal health services? And we looked at this in many different places because where you, wherever you look in the world, you can see variants of collaborative practice. Sometimes they're pretty good. Sometimes they're very, very rudimentary. And we were very aware of the cultural differences that drive collaborative practice. I mean, the cultural differences are not so great in the educational systems, but when you look at a developing country as opposed to developed country, then there are very different cultural mechanisms that play into collaborative practice. So we, were, we, are, aware, we are aware of this, continue to be aware of these cultural differences, and frequently we'll say to people, there's not one size that fits all, okay? Because of the culture. So then we, then, then we said, well, okay, so we will recognize these cultural differences, but what do we see if we look globally at what it is that people are trying to do in order to collaborate? Well, lo and behold, we come back to, if you recall from the slide in education, institutional support mechanisms. You know, what are the governance models in practice that either facilitate or get in the way of collaborative practice? And depending on how highly developed the health social care system is, the governance models can be very, very different. Then what are the structured protocols that are in place already that you in a sense have to overcome in order to facilitate collaborative practice. We looked at operating resources, where are they shared and how are they shared if they are shared? Because we saw frequently that there were operating resources going into X, Y, and Z in a health social care setting, but they weren't shared in a way which would facilitate collaborative practice. And that led us to talking about, well, are there personnel policies that get in the way of this? You know, what, are, what is the HR, the human resource department doing about policies that would really try to facilitate this kind of act, uh, interprofessional activity? And then supportive management practices, you know, is it all about clinical trials or is it about patient care? And in big academic environments, we're all aware that research is dependent on clinical trials. So the supportive management practice were really, really important and are still, I mean, these support mechanisms are still incredibly important. And then if you look at the working culture and environmental mechanisms, you see the same kinds of things that we see in education. You know, what are the communication strategies within a uh, healthcare setting? Um, how do you deal with conflict? And as you know, as we're reviewing uh, the competency framework, both in Canada and the United States, we're changing the language around conflict resolution. But you know, there are in place in the system already conflict. Re and it's really important because we know from looking at the data that conflict arises when it looks like you're taking a bit of my practice and you're taking a bit of my practice and you're taking a bit of, how do you overcome that kind of conflict to facilitate collaborative practice? Shared decision-making, really, really, really important. And then what's the built environment for doing this? You know, are there facilities where people can come together as a collaboration to talk about patient care? Now I'll use patient, but forgive me, I mean, I understand client and et cetera, et cetera. And then what, is the, what should the design be like so that it really does facilitate um, collaboration? Um, now, these built environments and space design are still huge, huge issues, and um, I'm not sure that we will ever get that quite right, because, again, it depends on the organization and how, they're, how their building has been designed in the first place and how it can be retrofitted in order to, to foster collaborative practice. But these mechanisms, you see them all over, and we saw them in the framework. We tried to pull them together and give examples of why it was we were focusing on them. So what you will read in the report is that um, the ideas that we tried to develop were, first of all, you have to develop a clear work plan. It doesn't matter whether it's in education or on the, on the practice side. If you don't have a clear work plan, you don't know where you're going. And if you don't know where you're going, you're going to end up nowhere, right? 
And it sounds so silly. I mean, it sounds so simple. Develop a clear work plan. Well, you have to do it right from the get-go. And as you do that, you have to have a robust evaluation framework. You can't just have a work plan and say, okay, get on with it. Downstream, you have to be able to tell policymakers this has made an economic difference. This has made a service difference. Really, really important. And we we had we looked at <clears throat> what people were trying to do. The evaluation frameworks were pretty shaky. Um, and then funding equitably and accountably. You know, if you are going to have collaborative practice or collaboration within the educational systems, you have to be sure that it's not, oh, here's a dollar for interprofessional education. You can do it on a Friday afternoon when it's raining in Vancouver between 1.30 and 2.30. You, you can't fund this kind of thing, um, you know, with a dollar. So we said, well, you know, maybe we should tell people that the dollar you have is the dollar you have. Figure out how to make it accountable for developing interprofessional collaborative practice. And then you have to collaborate with all the concerned part. We saw that time after time after time that there would be a small group of people who were collaborating, but it didn't include everybody. <clears throat> and if you are going to change a system, everybody who's in the system has to be part of that change. So we, we said, I think very clearly, collaborate with all the concerned parties. And then, as I said in the previous slide, provide some design space and certainly complete administrative support for the initiative. Very, it doesn't, doesn't matter where you look, you see these issues time after time after time. And then <clears throat> we looked at some of the critical success factors because by 2010, we were already profiting from work that was taking place in the United Kingdom, in Europe, in the United States, in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and beginning in Asia and in Africa. Um, so we said, well, you know, if you look at it, what we're talking about is really a workforce strategy, all right? What we're trying to do is to change the way in which the workforce is developed and then in the way in which the workforce works. And, and to do that, you have to promote interprofessional education for collaborative practice at governmental institution organizational levels. You know, think about it as a workforce strategy. And then we said, well, if you look at some of the places where it's been really successful, clearly people had gone to places, gone to people, and then encouraged strategic and innovative partnerships. And we saw some very interesting partnerships across what were to us kind of strange entities in the system, the engineers and the architects, you know, we hadn't really thought the veterinary medicine, we hadn't really thought about these issues. And then we saw people who come together around the social determinants of health who really were building strategic innovative partnerships. So that was another critical success factor. And then facilitating new knowledge creation, exchange application across all the constituencies. We see a lot of that happening now, and we'll come to that in just a moment. And then make sure that the responsibility is shared between everybody. It's not oh, that's your job to do IPE. No, it's not your job. It's everybody's job. It's everybody's job every day in every possible way. And we saw where there was success. It was because people were in fact sharing this responsibility and saying, we're all in this together. And <laughs> just as a matter of the actors and agencies you want to bring in, this was from uh, the 29th Pan American Sanitary Conference. Very interesting. Um, promote research, the sharing of experience, cooperation among countries in such areas as interprofessional health teams. This was from PAHO. And, you know, this was an amazing movement. So actors and agencies spread across a number of very different frontiers. So how would you create culture for change thinking about workforce? Um, so integrating interprofessional education. That's what we're all trying to do, I think everybody who's probably on this webinar today, we're all trying to integrate it. And we're trying to integrate it with health goals that are articulated in consultation documents, like some of the ones I previously mentioned. When we look at it, we have to say, oh, the WHO is saying this, you know, somebody in the United States is saying that, some agents are saying that, another agency in some other country is saying it. We've got to make sure 
that we're in we're integrating into professional education in the goals that are articulated in those documents because if we don't then it's never going to get there and globally i think one of the uh, successes we've had is to get it into the global uh, the strategy on hum health human resources the workforce 2030 we, interprofessional education is in there and again you can see this kind of downstream effect from the framework beginning to get into these documents and once it gets into the documents that the WHO produces, certainly in developing countries, a lot of notice is taken of these kinds of initiatives, okay? And then knowledge exchange. Well, we've had an incredible downstream effect, I think. Well, I don't know if we have, but certainly a downstream effect of the uh, framework has been, for example, the National Center in the United States. What an amazing organization, just totally amazing you know, um, that has been put together by our colleagues, that is really, and it is the nexus, really is um, a, an amazing source for exchanging information, creating information, and then learning how to apply what it is that's already out there. So the procedures that we looked at to reach the objectives, just to repeat myself, is to facilitate connections between the important stakeholders. Now, who are the important stakeholders? The important stakeholders are, of course, what we saw were policymakers. It wasn't necessarily the people who were doing the groundwork. The facilitators were, in countries like Canada, the deputy ministers of health, for example. If you didn't have the deputy ministers on side to talk about, you know, how are we going to do integrated collaborative care, then it was pretty difficult to get this interprofessional notion um, onto the um, the view of that of those particular agencies. Um, and then focusing work in appropriate groups. Um, we saw that there was a lot of work, for example, around uh, maternal and child health. Um, and that pulled in a huge number, not a huge, a large number of other professionals. Because if you begin, as you've thought about, I'm sure, maternal child health, there are other lots of other agencies that are involved. And then, then establishing networks to support multi-site research. Well, Guess what? Isn't interprofessional.global doing just that kind of thing? You know, we have the networks. We're trying to look at, you know, what should multi-site research try to do across the globe? Um, and we knew from very early on that we needed a competency framework um, to kind of separate the competencies that are profession specific from competencies that are to do with interprofessional collaborative practice. So Canada and the United States um, developed competency frameworks. Both countries are now working on refreshes and talking to each other about common language across those frameworks. I think that there was, at the time we were writing the framework, a, fr a competency framework in the United Kingdom, but I, I can't be absolutely sure about that. But we knew that we needed to have a competency framework. Um, we knew that uh, it would be really important to have a virtual social network because if you think back to 2010, we had almost no social networking facilities at all. And yet, as the social networking facilities have developed, so we see, you know, these networks. So why are we on this webinar today? Because we have a social network. It's terrific. And then we listened to the, to the students because we knew that the students are, in fact, the champions for the future. And um, we have, you know, knowledge of some student-led organizations in different countries, and they are incredibly important um, to move, to move uh, the issues that are addressed in the framework forward. But it wasn't until we, we didn't really touch on the patient's voice. And um, we could see when we were looking across many different countries that the patients were absolutely integral to what it was that was being called collaboration. Um, so in 2015, we held a meeting here at the University of British Columbia on where's the patient's voice. It was the second meeting of the first one. And what we saw beginning was the development of a patient voices network. Um, that is that finally we were hearing patients saying nothing about us without us. And that, you know, if you, if you look back at the framework, you kind of see this kind of 
fuzz in the background, which is the patient. But we didn't bring that forward. But as we see the development of collaboration and we see patients saying, we have to be heard, then we begin to see this patient voice, these patient voices networks being established. And uh, for example, in um, Canada, um, the Canadian Interprofession, uh, the Canadian uh, Institutes for Health Research require that any research that's being conducted has to have a patient as part of the research team. So if the patient is part of the research team and if the patient has been attended to, taken care of, being part of, being the center of collaborative practice, then we can see this kind of movement of interprofessional collaborative practice into the research networks. And as I said earlier, the patient's voice has been really, the student's voice has been really, really important. So there was, there's a paper um, in 2016, the Journal of Interprofessional Care. And it was very interesting to see when we were doing the framework, the kinds of, because we did have students actually in our, in our group, to see that kind of articulation of, yes, we know what it is that we need to do in order to change you, you know, our mentors, our teachers, et cetera. Um, and there was a wonderful uh, report in 2018 from KP, um, a Twitter chat. And then there are these kind of um, organizational attempts to have groups of students address uh, interprofessional collaborative practice. So um, in the United States, we have Clarion, there's a healthcare team challenge, which has been around for a very long time, which was started at UBC. Um, and we have, uh, we have many different kind of attempts at doing this in different countries. And it's really successful because it really does get students not only to think and work together, but to have them learn how to use their voice um, to change the system. So this is, again, another big downstream effect of that, um, of the framework. Um, the policy platform is really, really, really fundamental. Um, what we haven't done, um, and which we were very aware of when we were writing the framework, was to reward the practice community. We kind of said, oh yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna do all of this stuff, you know, within the universities, the colleges, the institutes, um, and then we'll put them out and then the practice community will take care of them. Well, um, it was clear that um, in the work that we were doing around the framework, we didn't really have the practice community voice as loud as it should have been around what they needed in order to do the work of mentoring, of teaching um, students about working, learning together to work together. and. Um, I think this is still an issue. Um, I used to call it the Gilbert 60-40 rule, you know, 60% of a student's time is actually spent in community, 40% is spent on the university college campus. Um, but if we, we realize that if we didn't focus attention on the practice community and reward the practice community for carrying forward the notions of interprofessional education for collaborative practice, we really wouldn't get anywhere. The students would go out and they'd say, well, they don't do it out there or out there, they would say, well, we don't do that stuff. That's just what we talk about at the university. So that, and then prioritizing the range of complex activities that are associated with interprofessional education collaborative practice. You know, putting them at the top of the kind of intersectoral platform so that people recognize, ah, oh, this is not gonna be an easy job, but there are ways of handling a business plan you heard me say very much earlier, you know, what are the economic outputs of doing interprofessional education for collaborative practice? If you go to um, a policy making shop like governments um, with a story about interprofessional education, the politicians love it. Okay, the politicians will say, oh, that's a great story for me to take out to the voters, you know, it'll get me votes, etc. If you take that same story, however, to those people within the civil service, they'll say, so where's the data? Why should we do this? How, how's it gonna make any difference? So we have to know from the get-go, what is the kind of business plan that will ensure long-term sustainability? How can we say, 
there is, there is huge economic benefit of doing things this way. So just think about, I mean, we were, I was talking yesterday with one of my colleagues about um, the way in which healthcare is delivered in Canada. You know, we have fee for service. Um, it's uh, how many patients can you run through the practice in a day because, you know, that is what generates income to pay for the practice, et cetera, et cetera. And um, what we don't have data on, and we didn't have data on the framework, and what we really need data on is, you know, how do, how do we kind of cost putting an interprofessional group together in a practice, okay? So that we actually begin to mold the, the, the practice of health and social care interprofessionally. And to do that, you have to have a business plan. You have to be able to say, it's gonna cost us this much for this person, this person, this person, this person, and um, the outcome. And if we look at putting that money together in a big pot, and then how many patients can we see? How much better can we do the job? That's really, really important. And, but we only had a very vague idea about this um, when we were writing the framework. But since that time, it's become clearer and clearer of the need for business plans. And then target, targeting a strategic home for startup and ongoing programs. Again, when we looked at um, the way things were being done around the globe, it was clear that those people who had those country or those places that had said, we're gonna do it here to begin with. We're gonna do it in this community clinic to begin with as opposed to on the campus. Then you actually can in fact build kind of a strategy for sustainability. So you can, we, what we realized was we couldn't suggest everybody doing everything at the same time. That just wouldn't work. And it wasn't, and we could see that it didn't work. What was really important was to identify where things were being done in a particular place, and then what were the determinants that allowed those things to be done in that place. Okay, so um, that's a very interesting and I think very researchable topic, but one that we're still not entirely clear about. But um, when I look at things that have happened in my country and in countries that I visited, it's very clear that those places that have a home for a startup really get the idea of interprofessional education or collaborative practice fast and clear and sustainably. Um, so engaging the practice community, um, what was clear to us uh, when we were writing the framework was, who it looks to us like we're very Western oriented, you know, there's not a lot going on elsewhere. But what began to happen after the framework was published, and as I said earlier, when the WHO puts out a report in developing countries, near developing countries, these reports are taken with a lot of, of seriousness. So what we began to see was that PAHO, the Pacific um, Health Organization, began to pick up pieces of what were in the framework. And um, we did some, as a result of that, we did some very interesting work in Latin America and the Caribbean around interprofessional education, which is still going on. Um, and that is kind of a downstream effect of this, um, the, of the framework. And again, um, we see webinars now being done, um, and like our webinar today, um, around issues that have to do with collaboration. Now, they're not always specifically addressing issues that we would like to see them address, but people are beginning, you begin to see this kind of conversation about working together, learning together to work together in kind of different languages, if I could use that term, not as a language language. Um, and then prioritizing complex activities. Um, really, really, really interesting and important developments as interprofessional education has developed and I don't say this is necessarily as a result of the framework, although a lot of stuff can be traced back to it. So the Jeff Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia produces an amazing newsletter every, every year, twice a year, amazing newsletter. Um, Qatar University, where Altogether Better Health will be held later on this year, does a wonderful job on its website of putting out information about what they're doing. Um, and then uh, the University of Toronto, um, 
They've just changed their name to the Center for Advancing Collaborative Healthcare and Education, puts out an amazing, what they call an international journal. Again, you kind of look and say, hmm, downstream effects are spreading all over the place. So what is then um, the route to sustainability? <clears throat> well, those of us who have been engaged in interprofessional education.global and interprofessional research.global knew from a meeting that was held in Sydney, Altogether Better Health in Sydney, that it was going to be really, really essential for us to, to work from the same lexicon, use the same dictionary. Uh, so adopting global definitions of IPEC that encompass every health social care discipline and making sure that there's no room for multiple interpretations it's very difficult. We realized when we were doing the framework, it was very difficult to tease apart some pieces of stuff that were being presented to us as interprofessional because it wasn't clear that the definition of interprofessional education had been applied to the work being done. Um, and uh, I think, unfortunately, that might still be the case. There is still confusion about definitions. So we worked. We've worked on building a lexicon, which doesn't leave room for multiple interpretations. And we know, I think we all know that that's crucially important, particularly for practice and particularly for research, because if we're all going to do, use different terms for what it is that we're doing, we're never going to have any understanding about what it is we're doing. You know, it's the old problem um, of, um, Humpty Dumpty, you know, I can say whatever I want to say and it'll mean what I wanted to say. So a global definition for IP, uh, global definitions that don't leave room for multiple interpretations. And then a common set of principles um, to which every discipline can adhere. It became clear to us as we were writing the framework um, that there were kind of principles out there, but they weren't necessarily principles being applied to IPECP. But we knew that when the time came, we'd have to have a common set of principles um, so that each discipline that was part of our, our global interprofessional network, each discipline would be adhering to those same principles. Um, and then adopting a common set of core competencies, regardless of the discipline, regardless of geographic location. If we, if we are looking for sustainability, we reckon Hmm. If you have one set of competencies in this country, one set of competencies in another country, oh, and on a different continent, it's going to be that's apples, eggs, oranges, and bananas. So we said, let's have a core, a core, a set of core competencies that are common, um, and then building uh, strong research and evaluation programs. And what we discovered when we were doing the framework was that people would talk about research and evaluation as though they were the same thing. And that was a bit disconcerting because I'm sure everybody who's on this webinar clearly understands that research is one thing, evaluation is another. And we were particularly concerned about evaluation at that time because we wanted to be able to say, um, if we look at what is being done in this country around this issue, clearly using our evaluation program, it's making tremendous difference or huh, our evaluation shows it's not going anywhere. Um, but we, 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 dis, we knew that when we were developing the framework, we we're gonna to have to make very clear points about building, fostering and building research and evaluation. And as we all know, you know, now we have lots and lots and lots of research in place going on. And then to build interprofessional education into accreditation programs, <laughs> When we looked at, when we were working on the framework and we looked at accreditation, it was very muddled and very unclear what was happening. We could see you know, accreditation for a program in X, a program in Y, a program in Z, but um, not, it was not clear that there was any attempt to do anything about accreditation for interprofessional education. And so we've been, uh, we can see downstream because in Canada, we've just published a paper on our accreditation program it's really, really important to look at accreditation because it drives everything, okay? Um, so here's the lexicon, um, and then uh, ipr.global 
did a fantastic situational analysis and published it in 2022, looking at the status around the world of interprofessional education um, at that time. Um, and then uh, principles of assessment evaluation. If we look, we can see um, in 2015, already there was a look at, you know, how do you measure the impact? And then um, in 2000 from uh, what Robert Wood Johnson, you know, kind of um, evaluation of what are promising interprofessional collaboration practices. Two really, really, really important documents. But again, kind of you see them coming downstream from um, the framework. Well, I just wanted to say one thing about competence because um, it's clear that it is a huge issue. You know, David McClelland um, was a great guru on competence. And he said, if you're hiring a ditch digger, doesn't matter if his IQ is 90 or 110. What matters is if he can use a shovel. And we have to remember that, that, you know, uh, back in the day, um, 45 years ago, we measured people by who's the top of the class, not whether or not they were able to do the job. So when we're thinking about competency and competency framework, we have to, when we're thinking about interprofessional competences, we have to keep focusing, focusing on can these people working together use the shovel? Okay, very, very important. So here are the competency frameworks as they exist at the present time. Um, and there's a lot of similarity between the two of them. Um, and there's a whole history to that that we could tell. But again, a downstream effect. And of course, our incredible journals, Journal of Interprofessional Care, um, Journal of Interprofessional Education and Practice, Journal of Research in Interprofessional Practice and Education, and then the amazing job that IPR.global has done on looking at uh, transforming this discussion paper, very important piece of work, um, and I would recommend it. But you see, interprofessional care was there before the framework, and it was a very important British journal, which is now a universal journal, that kind of, as we progressed, you know, we began to see stuff appearing in the journal and in these journals that you say, hmm, we were talking about that. So let's look finally then at optimal health services because I'm out of time. Um, what are the delivery mechanisms? Capital planning, remuneration models, you know, a fee for sir, financing, commissioning, funding streams. These are delivery mechanisms. You have to think about all of these things. And when we looked at the way that, you know, things were happening around the globe, we could see oh, this place has terrific remuneration models, but this place has no funding streams, you know? This place has great commissioning, but there's no capital planning. So when you have a fragmented health system and you're looking at a strengthened health system, these health and education systems have to talk to each other because these delivery mechanisms apply across in both sectors. And then when you look at the safety mechanisms, because that was a huge, and still remains a huge issue. Think about risk management, accreditation, regulation, professional registration. And we don't have time to talk about this today, but when we were doing the framework, um, it was clear that, because I've said something about accreditation earlier, but it was also clear that regulation, legislation was going to be really important. It had to be put into professional collaborative practice words to that effect had to be put into legislation. Um, so the future direction for us was that governments had to recognize and implement meaningful policies for IPECP. So you go back to one of the documents I referenced earlier, you can see that happening. Um, the courses and projects specific should be offered as workplace learning, not necessarily within universities, colleges, and institutes. Now we should be doing this in the workplace. Uh, quality, everybody knows about QI approaches should be implemented to support in enhancing practice, et cetera. And then mentoring students um, and having students share their knowledge with their mentors, because we kind of think of it, we were kind of thinking of it as one way, you know, out as opposed to both ways. That is, we give the students information, they take it to the mentor, the mentor exchanges students um, information with the student and the student then exchanges information with a mentor, future direction. So this is an act that was passed in Nova Scotia, uh, one of the provinces of British Columbia around legislation. And you see right in the act, 
Regulation Health Professions Network Act interprofessional practice, enable an increase in interprofessional practice. It has to be in legislation. If it's not in legislation, there's absolutely no reason why a health social care agency should do anything about it. Once it's in legislation, something has to be done. So um, we have to modify the structures to support. So leadership, planning groups, kinds of things we're doing today. We have to develop more and more of these. Um, and we knew that. We knew that if we were to go anywhere, the framework had to be very clear about developing these leadership and planning groups, building incentives. The question is what's in it for me, right? You know, every time you look at what it is we're trying to do, that question is always lurking there. What's in it for me? So we have to be able to provide those people who we're now trying to bring into this activity a clear answer to that question. What's in it for you is better care for your patient. Remember in the definition, the last part of the definition says collaboration to improve patient care or quality of care and services. And isn't it wonderful to look today at interprofessional.global? You know, um, I had this notion of uh, influencers and, and thinking about a spreading influence. So in 1997, maybe there were a thousand of us, 2007, 10,000, 2017, 100,000, 2027, who knows? Um, my reckoning is for every one of us who's giving out to one other person, that one other person is giving, et cetera. So as influencers, our role is in incredibly important. As Bill Gates said, we overestimate the change that will occur in two years. <laughs> I was one of those people. And we underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10 years. And I underestimate, I think when we were doing the framework, we kind of underestimated the change that would occur in 10 years. And the change has been absolutely amazing. So what is the lesson learned? The lesson learned is commit to sustain. If you don't commit to sustain, this little cartoon applies. Who wants to change? Everybody puts up their hand. Then you say, who, you know, I mean, who wants change? And then you say, who wants to change? If you haven't committed to sustain, they all disappear. Thank you all for your attention. It's been a pleasure to talk to all my relations. John, we have a couple of questions. Um, and uh, there's a question regarding, uh, do you, um, uh, recommend a like is there a, a set location or repository where where some of that key lexicon and terminology um, exists that we can use in common I did share in the chat I shared the IPR got global lexicon and then also the um, the NAP the National Academies of Practice lexicon um, do you recommend anything else well, I, you know, as I said uh, during the talk, the, the re repository is, uh, is the National Center in Minneapolis. I mean, the Nexus is an amazing repository of information. Um, and uh, I think that, um, yes, yeah, certainly, you know, our own website, IP.G uh, website has uh, beginnings of really incredibly inf in interesting use information and IPR, IPR.G has information. But really, at the moment, the major repository is Nexus. Yeah, and then there's another question that was asked by um, uh, Gerard about, um, in terms of sustainability, um, uh, our, our, our organizations like IPG and IPR Global, the right, um, to use your vernacular, the right <laughs> <ditch> digger, um, <laughs> Uh, or, do, or do you think there will there'll be a new one that will evolve moving forward? Well, that's an interesting question, Gerard. Um, I, I'm, I'm hopeful because I'm the international president of Hopeaholics Anonymous. I'm hopeful that IP.G will be will serve that function. Um, and and as we develop, <clears throat> I know that <clears throat> it's really really important for IP.G to be seen by the WHO as the voice for interprofessional education collaborative practice. Um, you can't have more than one organization claiming to do, you know, what it is that IP.G is doing. So, um, yeah, <laughs> thanks for the ditch digger. Yeah, thank you very much, John. I mean, always 
so so important to go what I keep referring to as back to the future you know those seminal reports all the way back to 1964 and to appreciate um the 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 learning and all that you did review and and integrate and synthesize to come up with the framework in 2010 um is very important and I truly landed on um, the need for economic evidence, I think is where we really need to put some, some focus. And do any of our national, international agencies have like a repository, like an economic clearinghouse around economic evidence for IPE, IPC? Um, no, nobody, nobody at the moment. I mean, what we do know from the UN report uh, five years ago is that, um, Health, health and social care is not a cost, it's a benefit. And we have to really hammer home, you know, that fact. Um, we have, we had that, the, the data that went into the UN report was fantastic. Um, but we have to be able to say, um, and I really think, I'm gonna have a chat with my health economist friends. Um, we, we really have to be able to say the economic benefit of doing this is huge because instead of, you know, people working in isolation <clears throat> in their silos, when you bring them together, you reduce costs because you don't have duplication of effort. Um, just think of every health and social care profession trains its students, you know, to take a history. Well, if you were in a team-based practice, and I'm really concerned about primary health care, as I'm sure all of you are, if you're in a real team-based practice, you don't need everybody taking a case history, you know, it's, it, that, that's a simple, ex and that's an economic benefit. You know, because you, that means there's more time to spend working with a patient, client, customer, or service provider. Well, I can't remember what the Brits call it, but there is a term for it. Um, so, and I see the Heather has a question. I'm increasingly hearing a call for IPE to include students of practice and clinician learning about uh, with from each other. Um, since not all accreditation agencies currently embrace this, do you foresee a change in the lexicon in this regard? That's a very, that's a very, well, all the questions are always very interesting because they're ones I haven't thought about. But this is a very interesting one. And we were working on accreditation in Canada. Um, we worked with eight accrediting uh, agencies for professions. And I don't think this has ever come up. Um, we have to certainly have to think about it. Um, I hope we don't, I mean, the lexicon is not written in concrete, you know. So yes, it's possibly the case that parts of, parts of the language of the linguist I'm really interested in this, parts of the language will have to be massaged in order to encompass this, but you wouldn't want the kind of fundamental definition to change or the basic principles to change once we've said, yeah, this is what really works. But that's that's an interesting question. Um, oh yeah, the LCME. <laughs> well, of course we do LCME here in Canada. So yeah, student of education, very interesting. I'll take it and think about it, and we'll have a discussion in our accreditation group in CIHC. Thank you. And I and I believe uh, um, IPEC, who's uh, who in the United States, is um, when they're they're revising their core competencies and they're they're pulling more of those issues into that core competency development. Yeah, we're doing that. Um, So um, this recording will actually be posted on the IP.global um, website. So if you want to share it with colleagues um, so that they all can share in John's wisdom, um, I'll turn it over to Donna to wrap things up. Yeah, thank you again, everyone, for attending. And John, for, again, that um, fantastic um, trajectory you, you took us through. And uh, a few reports that I uh, obviously would like to go and, and read through again. And... I, I just wonder, you know, Workforce 2030 that was published in 2017, like what's coming next and and hope that, um, you know, many of us stay involved and sustain uh, what's currently happening. And actually, I know from our Canadian perspective, we do need to focus more in the practice context. So we're really um, trying to move those initiatives forward um, outside of the classroom and into into practice. Mm -hmm. So oh, really, um, again, the information is so helpful, so useful, and really nice to engage with a, a global group. Um, yeah, as as uh, Tony mentioned, this will be recording will be um, available, and truly appreciate that. 
I'm sure, John, if I, I can stay on a few more minutes if people want to open their mics and ask you more questions, but we will, people are busy, we will bid people adieu and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you.